In my therapy practice, a question that I would be asked frequently was along the lines of, is my spouse an alcoholic or just a heavy drinker? Is it a drinking problem or I think maybe they're just drinking because of this problem in their life or this stressor in their life? So I want to share with you today a key concept about addiction that applies to alcoholism, which is really gets to the core of this issue. And I also want to say almost everybody has someone in their life who struggles with alcoholism or addiction. It is unfortunately so common and it has a major impact on all of us. And yet we rarely talk about this. We don't talk a lot about addiction. We don't talk a lot about alcoholism. And we don't always talk about how this impacts the entire family system and community. But today I'm going to narrow into this question of whether or not the person has alcoholism. And you'll know soon why I put that in quotes. If you're new to my channel, just want you to know one of my specialties is working with people around boundaries and really navigating that space of how do I love and care for people while also taking care of myself and having healthy boundaries. I was a psychotherapist for 20 years and I also, during that time, I had a license in alcohol and drug counseling, which was actually fairly rare in my state. I think I was like the 700th person who ever had one. So I really have a lot of training in the issue of alcoholism and addiction and how that impacts the family system and how it impacts those of us in relationship with those with alcoholism or addiction. So I'm going to share with you the definition that I feel goes to the root of addiction, which is continued use despite negative consequences. So let me just say that again, continued use despite negative consequences. Because people often want to be like, well, how much do you have to drink to be an alcoholic? And it's really not a about the amount. I mean, obviously, some amounts might be so extreme that they would qualify you, but really, it's about continued use despite negative consequences. And I think at the heart of this question of, you know, is this person in my life addicted to alcohol or just a heavy drinker really goes to the stigma around the word alcoholic. And people don't want to say, oh, my partner is an alcoholic. They don't want to admit it. And people don't like to admit that about themselves. And it's unfortunate that we have such a stigma against it because I do think people would get more help if we did it. But just to clarify here, in the mental health field, the actual term used is substance use disorder. So if you go to a doctor and you describe your drinking to them or your partner does, they won't say, oh, yep, you're an alcoholic. They're going to say whether or not you have a substance use disorder. So if we go back to that question of, is my partner an alcoholic or a heavy drinker? Probably if their behavior is of concern to you and you would label them a heavy drinker, they're probably continuing to use despite negative consequences and probably would qualify for substance use disorder. And one way this sort of pushing the label away, right, the alcoholic label away, the one way that would show up in my office was often by somebody saying, well, you know, they really, they could stop whenever they want. I mean, they do drink too much and they do have all these negative consequences. But, you know, sometimes they'll go a few weeks without drinking. Irrelevant. It's irrelevant whether the person has a substance use disorder. Another thing people would say is, you know, well, they only drink on the weekends. Daily use is not required for a substance use disorder. Someone who only drinks on the weekends, but then drinks to the point where they can't remember where their car is, they take a cab home, and then they have no memory of where to find the car. And I know people to whom that has happened. That's a substance use disorder. Now, if it happens once and the person is young, right? Maybe it's not. It maybe wouldn't qualify. But if it is a continued pattern, definitely qualifies. So daily use, irrelevant to the diagnosis. And since I mentioned the issue of age, there is unfortunately in our society here in the U.S. a tendency for teenagers and college kids to way over drink, right? So yes, that would count as a substance use disorder. Does that mean that person will develop a long-term problem? Not necessarily. And it is unhealthy. And yes, it's dangerous. So it's a problem. But there is also kind of 
a culture around it. But if that person grows up and is getting towards their 30s and is still drinking in that way and their peers are not, because mostly their peers won't be, then that's really a sign that the person has a significant problem. And the other thing is that even with the kids, let's call them the kids, who are drinking, there's a difference in terms of whether they are fulfilling their responsibilities for their age or not, right? So somebody who is drinking too much and then having severe negative consequences, not getting schoolwork done, not making it to their job, and then also possibly doing things that violate their ethics, then that's a sign of a much more significant problem. And again, I'm not saying it's not all problematic, but there is a connection to your stage of life, the responsibilities, and whether you're fulfilling them, right? Because then again, that all ties back to that concept of consequences. Another thing that's really a sign of somebody who is likely to develop what we would call alcoholism with a substance use disorder is blacking out. Now, alcohol works differently for different people. It's a chemical response in our body. Some of us are biologically prone to being able to drink a lot, remain standing, but then have no memory of it the next day. That is is the sign of somebody who is more likely, physically more likely, to develop what we commonly call alcoholism. Now, obviously, if somebody frequently is always drinking to the point where they are throwing up, that is a problem. But somebody who throws up from drinking, that actually might be sort of a protective measure. I do know somebody who, when they were in middle school, they drank too much, they threw up, they never drank again, right? It was so much of a dramatic event for them. It was such a massive negative consequence to happen, like in front of other people, and it was so unpleasant, and they felt so sad. They never drank again. Somebody whose initial tolerance is much higher, right? Like maybe initially they can like they can handle their alcohol. Not necessarily a good sign. So if a person blacks out also a kind of a dangerous signal. So my guess is if you're sheer worried about your significant other or best friend or whatever, and whether they're a heavy drinker or not, my guess is you already have your answer. You probably already know that this is a serious problem. There's sort of a saying uh, that if you are asking this question, you already have the answer. So two things for you. One, I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivation for asking this question. And then to what can you do about it? So I'm wondering, why did you click on this video, right? What is your motivation for wanting to define this? Like, what difference does it make? If you watch this video and you're like, oh, no, just a heavy drinker, does that really change anything? I don't think so, right? So I think part of the motivation is like we have that resistance to the label alcoholic, right? So use the label substance use disorder, right? That might be one reason people worry about differentiating. But again, if the person's drinking too much, they're having negative consequences. It's impacting you. You have your answer. And if your motivation is to like show a video to a loved one and be like, see, see, really, it is a problem. Maybe you could do that once if you want. I don't know that it's going to be helpful. But if you've already sort of done that, it's just not worth doing again, right? Like understanding this for yourself, right? So if you are in a relationship, with somebody with an addiction, know that this has pervasive impact on you. It is worth understanding it. It is worth learning about it. And then it's worth really beginning to focus on what you want and what you can do. I'm about to put out a video on codependency and addiction. And so codependency, like a kind of a core definition of that, is that your emotional well-being is dependent on another person's emotional well-being. So if you feel like, well, I can't be okay unless they stop drinking, or I can't be happy unless they put down their addiction, that's a definition of codependency. Now, look, I know that this is like a really hard place to be. If you have a loved one who has an addiction, it is so painful and there's just so many emotions that go with it all the time. And of course, your feelings of well-being 
are tied to this person, right? Like, of course, you love them. But learning how to detach with compassion is key because you didn't cause this, you can't cure it, and you can't control it, right? Those are sort of key elements of this. And of course, your feelings of well-being are tied to this person, right? Like, of course, you love them. But learning how to detach with compassion is key because you didn't cause this, you can't cure it, and you can't control it, right? Those are sort of key elements of this. So do make sure you're subscribed if you're not, which is also helpful for my channel if you support this work. But look for the video on codependency and addiction. And then I'm also going to put one out specifically on boundaries when you have somebody in your life who has an addiction. And shifting to figure out what are you sacrificing in your life in order to try to help this person or try to focus on them or just in general, what are you sacrificing? What do you want? What boundaries can you set, right? And I do have a boundary personality quiz that highlights the positive core statement you might have about yourself that underlies some of your helping behavior, which is wonderful. We all should have and want to have behavior where we focus on helping others. But when it gets to the point where we're actually enabling somebody else's dangerous behavior or self-destructive behavior, right, that's kind of a limit. Or if it gets to the point where we're not taking care of ourselves. So sometimes our positive core beliefs, how we view ourselves, limit our boundaries. And then those positive core beliefs always have a counter, which is a negative core belief, which really underlies a lot of the places that we get stuck in life. So focusing on healing for you and figuring out where your limits are, your boundaries, that your emotions, your needs, and your wants matter also. And I just also just want to say, no matter what, this is an incredibly difficult situation to be in and reaching out for support is key. And I just want to put in here a little tag for Al-Anon, which is a 12-step program for spouses, partners, friends, and family members of people who have alcoholism. And there are other similar Anon groups for other addictions and it is a place where you can find an enormous amount of information and support, which is really helpful. All right. I hope this was helpful for you. Let me know. Give me a comment, and I'll see you next week.